This video will teach you how to transition a patient from tube feeding to oral feeding. You'll learn how to determine if a patient is a candidate for a swallowing assessment, how the swallowing assessment may be performed, and what to do with the tube feeding once oral feeding begins. Frank is a 64-year-old male with a past medical history of alcoholic cirrhosis who was admitted to the hospital with confusion and lethargy secondary to hepatic encephalopathy. He was seen by a speech-language pathologist on hospital day one, but he couldn't focus for long enough to participate in the assessment, and the SLP recommended against oral feeding until his mental status improved. A nasogastric tube was inserted by the physician's assistant later that evening, and Frank was started on a continuous tube feeding infusion the following morning. You're the dietitian who has been managing the tube feeding, and you receive a new consult from the attending physician on hospital day 5 that states, Mental status is improving and we would like to start a diet. Please assist. In a perfect world, somebody would immediately remove the feeding tube, and Frank would resume his usual diet. Although this happens sometimes, many times there needs to be a transitional period in which the patient's ability to safely swallow, eat, and drink is closely evaluated. Rushing the removal of a feeding tube and the initiation of a diet can put the patient at risk of aspiration, choking, unintentional weight loss, and a deterioration of their nutritional status if they suffer from dysphagia or common symptoms of acute and chronic illness like anorexia and early satiety. As a result, it's best to follow a series of steps that are completed through a collaborative effort between the patient and interdisciplinary team members. The first step for transitioning a patient from tube feeding to oral feeding is to determine if they're a candidate for a swallowing assessment. With Frank, you'd like to think the physician who placed the consult figured this out, but you never know, so it's always important to check. Generally speaking, a patient is considered a good candidate for a swallowing assessment if they have periods when they're alert enough to follow simple commands, like opening and closing their eyes and mouth, sticking out their tongue, and tightening their grip when asked to. They're also considered a good candidate if they can maintain an upright position of at least 30 degrees for at least 30 minutes at a time, and if there are no obvious barriers to eating or drinking, such as an impending procedure that requires a fasted state, imminent intubation due to compromised respiratory function, or a medical condition or recent surgery that temporarily prevents the use of the gastrointestinal tract. Thus, a patient is generally considered a poor candidate for a swallowing assessment if they're too lethargic or confused to follow simple commands, if they're unable to maintain an upright position in the bed, or if they have an obvious barrier to eating or drinking. Remember that altered mental status isn't an absolute contraindication to a swallowing assessment. It's actually quite common for patients with altered mental status to eat by mouth. Nevertheless, there's a clear distinction between someone who doesn't know which hospital they're in but can follow commands, and someone so confused they wouldn't be able to sense the presence of food in their mouth if you put it there. Once a patient is determined to be a good candidate for a swallowing assessment, the next step is to perform a swallowing assessment. Here, your instinct may be to go directly to the SLP. After all, they're the expert at assessing the safety of oral feeding and identifying the appropriate diet texture and liquid consistency to provide. However, you must remember that there are often far more patients than there are SLPs, and if their schedule is packed with those who require their expertise, then you shouldn't place new consults for those who don't. So, it's essential to recognize patients who need an evaluation by the SLP and patients who can undergo an assessment by a nurse or another trained clinician. According to this recent decision guide for assessing a patient's readiness for oral intake after extubation, some patient factors that should trigger an evaluation by the SLP in the hospital include a history of dysphagia and need for diet texture modification, a prolonged intubation of greater than 48 hours, the presence of a tracheostomy, an impaired respiratory function requiring a high-flow nasal cannula or escalating oxygen requirements, a facial droop or inability to manage saliva, and recent head and neck cancer or cervical spine surgery.
patients with none of these factors can undergo a three ounce water swallow challenge with a nurse or another trained clinician. With this swallowing assessment, patients are given three ounces of water and asked to drink the entire amount in sequential swallows without stopping. If they complete it without issue, they can receive regular solids and thin liquids, or whichever diet texture and liquid consistency aligns best with their preference or dentition. But if there's interrupted drinking, coughing, choking, throat clearing, or a wet or gurgly voice during or after ingesting the water, then a consult for the SLP is warranted. The only time you may not ask for an SLP evaluation after a failed 3 ounce water swallow challenge is if the patient's performance is so poor that they're no longer being considered for diet advancement. If you're enjoying this video so far, make sure you hit the like button, share it with a friend, and shop for more free and exclusive content by clicking the link in the video description. Patients who pass the 3 ounce water swallow challenge or are cleared for oral feeding by the SLP progress to the third step, which is to start the patient on a diet and monitor oral intake. At this stage, I recommend meeting at least 80% of the estimated energy needs through tube feeding and monitoring intake for 3 to 5 days. If the patient is on a continuous infusion, you can consider transitioning them to a cyclic, intermittent, or bolus feeding regimen. This is because the built-in times when the feeds are held can help to build an appetite leading into meal times. Monitoring of oral intake can be achieved by documenting the percentage of meals and oral nutritional supplements consumed and the types of foods and beverages consumed, if possible. It doesn't have to be a formal calorie count, which is challenging to execute with precision in most clinical settings. You're really just trying to get a rough approximation of the patient's ability to eat and drink. You'll also want to obtain feedback from the patient whenever you can, like their feelings of fullness and perceived barriers to improving their oral intake. After three to five days of monitoring oral intake, it's time to assess the oral intake and adjust the tube feeding. Assessment of oral intake takes place by comparing the patient's recent oral intake to their estimated energy demand. To do this, you need to know approximately how many calories the diet and supplement provide each day. For example, if a patient consumes an average of 40% of a puree diet in the 3 to 5 days, then you need to know that the puree diet at your institution provides 1800 calories. This way, you can estimate an average intake of 720 calories per day. Again, this is a rough approximation, so avoid getting too caught up in the numbers. Using the intake data and subjective information obtained from the patient, here is my approach to adjusting tube feeding. If the patient is meeting less than 25% of the estimated energy demand by mouth, I continue to meet at least 80% of it through tube feeding and add an oral nutritional supplement and any snacks that may help to increase oral intake. If the patient is meeting 25 to 50% of the estimated energy demand by mouth, I adjust the tube feeding to provide 50% of it. I also consider adding an oral nutritional supplement and snacks and reducing the feeding time, whether that's going from continuous to cyclic, an 18-hour cyclic infusion to a 12-hour cyclic infusion, or intermittent feeding over 1 hour to intermittent feeding over 30 minutes. If the patient is meeting 50 to 75% of the estimated energy demand by mouth, I adjust the tube feeding to provide 25% of it and consider the supplements, snacks, and a shorter feeding time. Finally, if the patient is meeting greater than 75% of the estimated energy demand by mouth, I recommend holding the tube feeding and preparing to remove the tube. Throughout this process, patients should continue to work with the SLP, with the diet texture and liquid consistency upgraded whenever feasible and downgraded if necessary. In addition to this, the entire approach should be viewed as a process that repeats. After the assessment of oral intake occurs and the tube feeding is adjusted, you go back to monitoring the oral intake and reassess the oral intake a few days later. As time goes on, patients can move forward in the process and have their feeding tube removed. They can also move backward or remain stagnant, ending up in a position where a long-term feeding tube is considered. Or if they already have a long-term feeding tube in place, they can remain stagnant at a certain level of oral intake for months or years.
No matter the case, I think it's good practice to continue to document the percentage of meals and supplements consumed, provide feeding assistance and encouragement to eat, obtain weight measurements at a regular interval, whether that's weekly or biweekly, and monitor urine and stool output. All of this information feeds right back into assessing intake and making changes. Keeping Frank in mind, let's pretend we determine he's a good candidate for a swallowing assessment. Since he presented with dysphagia on hospital day one, now that he's more alert and following commands, he remains a candidate to be evaluated by the SLP instead of the 3 ounce water swallow challenge. The SLP clears Frank for a minced and moist diet with thin liquids, he gets started on it that day, and the rate for the continuous tube feeding is adjusted to provide 80% of the estimated energy demand. After three days on the diet, Frank is found to be meeting an average of 40% of his estimated energy demand by mouth, so an oral nutritional supplement is added, and the continuous infusion is switched to a 12-hour cyclic infusion that provides 50% of his total calorie needs. The following afternoon, the SLP reevaluates and clears him for regular solids. Then after another three days of monitoring, he's found to be meeting 90% of the estimated energy demand by mouth. The tube feeding is held, excellent oral intake continues, and the feeding tube is removed. Coming to the end, I want to touch upon three relevant concepts. The first concerns the customization of intermittent or bolus feeding when oral feeding is introduced. With this, one option is to provide a meal, observe the intake, and then provide tube feeding directly after it, with the volume adjusted to account for whatever the patient couldn't eat. For instance, if the goal is for the patient to eat at least 50% of all their meals, but they only consume 25% at lunch, then it will trigger a bolus of a set volume of formula to make up for the deficit. While I think this concept makes the most sense in theory and is suitable for the home or long-term care setting, I've tried doing it in the acute inpatient setting and haven't had much success, primarily due to confusion over the protocol among the nursing staff tasked with carrying it out. With that said, it remains an option for you to consider. The second concept concerns improvisation when cases don't unfold according to plan. Even though I've outlined a simple process where the patient remains on tube feeding and gradually increases their oral intake, this differs from what sometimes happens in practice. Sometimes patients start eating 100% or more of their meals on the very first day, and their ability to meet their nutritional needs by mouth is so obvious that there's no need to keep the feeding tube in place. Other times, the feeding tube may fall out on the first day, and the team may be unable to replace it, or the patient may be unwilling to receive a new one, at which point your plan for careful weaning gets lost. The point here is that you should never trick yourself into thinking the hospital course will go a certain way, and you should prepare to be flexible with your process. Finally, the third concept concerns goals of care for feeding. When balancing tube feeding and oral feeding, you should do whatever you can to learn the patient's goals for artificial nutrition and hydration, which may be outlined in their advanced directives. For example, if a patient has an overall poor prognosis and is approaching the end of their life, they may not want a drawn-out process of monitoring and assessing their oral intake. They may just want the feeding tube removed and eat whatever they can without worrying about whether they're eating enough. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel.